The Theory of Knowledge, an Islamic Perspective by Ayatullah Murtada Matahari. The Discovery of the Unconscious Mind as an Example of Symbolic Knowledge. Man can be studied in two aspects, the physical bodily aspect and the psychic spiritual aspect. Whatever is related to his physical aspect is studied in medical science, whereas whatever is related to the psychic spiritual aspect is examined in Ilm al-Nafs, which is nowadays known as psychology. Of course, today the different fields of science have undergone quantum leaps. For example, medicine itself has numerous branches now. Apart from medicine, other sciences like ethnology are relevant to the human body as discussed today, but for the meantime, they are not our concern. In the past century, there emerged a field of science of the human psyche and soul which is a subfield of psychology, but much different from the past studies of psychology. So, it is called psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is actually a branch of psychology that deals with man's unconscious mind and not with his conscious mind. That is, it has been discovered that the human mind has two realms or parts, the conscious realm, which has been known to us from the very beginning, and the unconscious realm, which has been discovered by science today. What is the difference between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind? The conscious mind refers to those parts of our mind whose existence in us we are aware of. For example, feeling in the sense of perceiving by the five senses exists in us. Our eyes can see and we are aware that our eyes can see. Our memory records for itself whatever we feel. We are also aware that we have the faculty of memory. Sometimes we say that our memory becomes weaker or stronger, or my memory is stronger or weaker than so-and-so's. Similarly, we are aware that we have the faculty of reasoning and thinking. That is, there are thoughts within the realm of our conscious being. There is a set of inclinations, likes, desires, disgusts, fears, and the like within us, and we can feel their existence. If there is yearning for position in us, we can also feel its existence, knowing that we desire to acquire high position. There are anger and indignation within us, and we can also perceive them. We can perceive our instincts. Meanwhile, the unconscious mind refers to the things pertaining to the mind, but we are unaware of them, and we cannot perceive them in us. Two Salient Features of the Unconscious Mind The unconscious mind has two salient features. One of its features is that it rules over the conscious mind. The unconscious mind gives orders for the conscious mind to obey. For this reason, it is said that the two are like a factory whose engine house and energy department are located at the basement, while its metallic parts that perform final operations are located on the surface. Outside observers can only see the surface and assume that this is the whole factory, without knowing that the upper part is subservient and controlled by the lower part, which is its base. If there is any activity in the upper portion, it is because of the activities and forces located in the lower portion. The second salient feature is that apart from the fact that the basement or lower portion of our soul, the unconscious mind, is in command while the conscious mind is a subordinate, the former is much larger and greater. Compared to the unconscious portion, the conscious portion of our mind constitutes the smaller or minor part. Our unconscious portion constitutes the significant part of our mind. As a simile or an example, if a watermelon or the ice cube is immersed in water, only a small portion of it actually surfaces, as the bigger portion is covered by water. It is said that just as a great part of the watermelon or the ice cube is submerged in water, the greater part of the human mind is also hidden from our consciousness. A very small part of it is that which we can perceive and whose existence we are aware of. In olden days, there was a popular belief, and I do not know to what extent it is true, but people thought that dwarfish individuals were very smart and intelligent. They said that these individuals, as can be seen, have only a very small height, but their intelligence is as if it were meant for ten times that height. This was a popular belief, but it became known later that all people are like that. Each of them is, quote, dwarfish, quote, but mentally. A portion of his mind, that is the smaller portion of it, is that which he can perceive and whose existence he is aware of. The bigger portion is that part whose existence he is not conscious of.
Hidden Secrets of the Human Mind in the Qur'an and Du'ai Kumail. In this regard, there are points in the Noble Qur'an and the sayings of Imam Ali, peace be with him, as well as sages and mystics like Rumi. That is, sages and mystics have also considerably paid attention to this point. For the meantime, we will not discuss the subject they have raised. We shall only quote a passage from the Holy Qur'an and some words of Imam Ali, peace be with him, from Du'ai Kumail and we shall presently pass by this part of the subject. It is thus stated in the Blessed Surah Taha, verse 7 in the Noble Qur'an, He indeed knows the secret, and what is still more, hidden. That is, God is aware of the secrets, He is cognizant of the hidden things, and He is even aware of the more hidden of the hidden things. What is this more hidden of the hidden things? For man, there is nothing more hidden than that which he hides in his heart. If he buries it in the heart of the earth or hides it somewhere else, it may still be found by someone else. But if it is in the form of a secret, such that it is totally kept in the heart, then nothing is more hidden than this for man. The Imam, peace be with him, was asked, Why does the Qur'an say that God knows the secret as well as what is more concealed than the secret? The Imam, peace be with him, said, What is more concealed than the secret is that which exists in you, but you do not know it, or you forget it. In Du'ai Kumail, Imam Ali, peace be with him, also states, Those whom you, that is God, have appointed to watch over and record every action of mine. Then, in order for people not to suppose that God sends angels, like someone who, God forbid, is in need of agents and cannot do his job alone, or who is in need of a partner in dominion, the supplication then continues and says, And you, O God, are yourself the watcher over me from behind them, and the witness of what is hidden from them. That is, there are things in me which are hidden even to the angels who are unseen agents. In other words, some aspects of my being are unseen or concealed. Even the angels are not aware of them, and they cannot be aware of them. But you yourself testify that you are witness to that which is hidden even to them. From this, man can realize that the question of man's soul is so amazing that the Qur'an describes it as a secret more hidden than secrets. And Imam Ali, peace be with him, says that there are things in the soul of man which are hidden even to the angels, and only God is aware of them. The question thus begs, from where and how does this unconscious mind develop? Psychoanalysists have diverse theories in this regard. Freud's Theory Freud, who is the godfather of psychoanalysis, believed that all elements of the unconscious mind of man escape from the conscious mind and settle themselves down there. That is, the unconscious mind's elements had initially been in the conscious mind, but they secretly crossed the demarcation line between the conscious and the unconscious mind and went to the realm of the unconscious mind, in which they gradually formed their sphere which is much greater, vaster, and more complex than the conscious mind. According to Freud, this escape happens especially during the post-expulsions of the mind. Post-expulsions refers to the moment when human instincts and inclinations tend to express themselves, but man is prohibited from expressing them. And in the words of Freud, man is being censored. Social norms and ethos do not allow a portion of man's conscious mind to express itself. For instance, one's eyes fall on a certain thing, but he is unable to satisfy his eyes' cravings. Of course, Freud lays more stress on sexual inclinations. The human being has sexual desires, or inclinations, but the social conditions and environment sometimes do not allow him or her to express them. He or she has no option but to forget this desire or this so-called love. For example, one walks down the street and his eyes fall on a beautiful face, and his heart follows his eyes' desire. Yet he senses that he cannot pursue it as the pathway is closed for him. He cannot see any option but to forget it. And outwardly, he forgets it, but in reality, he does not. It is not something to be forgotten. When this desire senses that it will not be allowed to appear in this portion, it flees to the other portion of the mind and settles in the unconscious mind. This desire or inclination always knows that whenever it wants to express itself, it will be told, get lost, and it will not be allowed to express itself. But it cannot afford to remain in the unconscious mind forever. So what shall it do? 
It disguises or camouflages itself. It puts a mask on its face, and it is like someone who is a fugitive in a country, flees from it, and goes to another country. He knows that if he returns to his home country with the same facial features, personal information, and passport, he will immediately be apprehended to the port of disembarkation. Yet he wants to return home. So what shall it do? He has to change his name, adopt a tampered passport, undergo plastic surgery, and enter his home country. Freud believes that many expressions of man's unconscious mind are expelled elements of the conscious mind that initially have a lowly, base, and animalistic form. Then, they flee and go to the unconscious mind. They have no option but to go out in disguise, having a different garment and facial identity. For example, they come out in guise of a moral virtue. When a person feels that a kind affection appears in his heart and he wants to serve in charity institutions, it is only then that this feeling will be allowed to manifest itself. Why? It is because it has already changed its identity, passport, garment, and facial appearance. Freud does not believe in genuine humanity at all, saying that whatever is called humanity or human nobility is bestiality in essence. It is the same expelled bestiality of the unconscious mind that went deeper and appeared outside without changing its nature or essence, but with a different face, identification card, passport, and outfit. As such, Freud's theory is one of the Western theories that totally tramples upon the basis and definition of humanity, thereby ringing the death knell of humanity. This is Freud's theory. Whatever you do, if you say, Mr. Freud, we have Abu Dhar as well as Muawiyah, and we have Lumumba as well as Shombi, he will say, essentially, there is no difference between Abu Dhar and Muawiyah, Lumumba and Shombi. Prophet Musa and Pharaoh, God forbid. Why? According to him, all are of the same essence. Whatever Muawiyah desired was also desired by Abu Dhar. Whatever Shombi craved, Lumamba also craved. Lumamba was the same Shombi whose bestial inclinations had not been allowed to be expressed or to be shown and were then consigned to the unconscious mind from which they surfaced in the guise of freedom justice, humanitarianism, liberty, and egalitarianism. In relation to Muawiyah, Abu Dhar is of the same type. However, other psychoanalysts have rejected this interpretation or explanation of the unconscious mind. Carl Gustav Jung's Theory Freud had a student named Jung. Jung acknowledged the existence of the unconscious mind, but rejected Freud's explanation that all elements of the unconscious mind are expelled elements of the conscious mind, sexual elements in particular. Jung was of the opinion that some portions of our con unconscious mind are innate, or fitri, and constitute the foundation of man's humanity. That is, the sense of morality, the sense of worship and devotion, the love for knowledge, the quest for truth, the love for beauty, and all human beings are pillars of human nature which exist in man's unconscious mind. Before something is expelled from our conscious mind, these elements of the unconscious mind already exist. So our unconscious mind is of two parts, the God-given fundamental, intrinsic, and sublime human elements which exist and must be nurtured, and also the expelled elements of man's conscious mind. Today, however, there is essentially no doubt or dispute that the human mind has two divisions, the conscious and the unconscious, and that the unconscious mind, which is much more expansive, supervises and takes control of the conscious mind. The issue of inculcation, talqeen. Inculcation, or talqeen, is one of the main issues in the science of the soul, ilm al -ruh. Nowadays, through the unconscious mind, how the human mind is being inculcated can be explained well. Even when awake, man is subject to inculcation, but since the soul resists it, its effects cannot be noticed as when he is asleep. If a person could be subjected to a mesmeric sleep through hypnotism, whatever would be inculcated in him would penetrate his unconscious mind because it makes no difference to the unconscious mind whether a person is asleep and when he is awake, he cannot perceive that something is inculcated or taught to him. Gustave Le Bon said to the effect, 
I want to experiment to what extent the issue of inculcation and the unconscious mind is true. A young woman was brought and subjected to a mesmeric sleep. In that state, whatever I wished was inculcated in her. I wanted to say that this young woman would promise to meet me on a given day, time, and crossroad for an academic question. After a few days, the same young woman wrote and telephoned me thus, Sir, I have a problem which I think no one can solve except you. If you do not mind, I want to meet and consult you on such and such day, time, and crossroad. That is, whatever had been inculcated in her unconscious mind appeared in her conscious mind without her knowing that it had been inculcated in her unconscious mind by someone else. Today, the issue of physical treatment of many ailments through the psychic means such as inculcation has been officially acknowledged and is thus focus of much attention. If you read the book Tadawiye Ruhi or Spiritual Treatment by Hussein Kazimzadeh, you will see that there are very interesting discussions in this regard. The Unconscious Mind and the Proof of the Soul's Existence as we have said, the existence of man's unconscious mind is an indisputable fact. The discovery of the unconscious mind yields two results for the theists. One of these results pertains to the very question of the soul. The discovery of the unconscious mind proved the existence of the soul even more than before, because after that discovery, it became evident that the things that take place in the unconscious mind are not related at all to the five senses. Even Freud believed that many cases of insanity are not caused by neural ailments but are caused by a command from the unconscious mind. Sometimes it is said that so-and-so became insane due to sorrow, and there are really people who become insane because of sorrow and grief. Of course, it is insanity in the sense that they are in a state of half-wittedness, and they have no more such sorrow and grief. When these individuals are medically treated, no physical sickness can be detected, yet in actuality it can be observed that there is something wrong with them mentally. Why is it so? Sometimes these people are afflicted with very serious and intolerable sufferings. It is here that the unconscious mind is at work. That is, it works in such a way that it could cause malfunctioning of the conscious mind. They find a niche for themselves in the world of imagination, illusion, and hallucination. When they are in a such a state, for example, it does not bother them if their children die. I have met some of these people, and I have observed that they are really excellent in some works. That is, like normal people, they are smart, intelligent, and witty. But unfortunately, in other aspects, they have this state of half-wittedness. After some investigation, it becomes clear that they are such people. It becomes obvious, as the poet thus says, of the sober ones of the world, whoever I saw has a sorrow. O oh heart, be insane, for insanity, too, has a world of its own. This is not just sheer poetry, as it has a parcel of the truth. Sometimes, be insane, for insanity has a world of its own, is a command to man by the inner senses which say this intelligence is the root of trouble. It brings about afflictions and adversities. Be insane, not in the sense that you do foolish things, but we will do something that will make you insane without you discerning it. One of those who are suffering from this affliction was in a state of hallucination. One of his delusions was that whenever he would feel sick, he would make a vow or another to cook cello kebab for his recovery. In sum, the first result of the discovery of the unconscious mind was that it clarified well the question of the soul's existence. It became clear that the human mind is far more profound than the childish claim of certain materialists that the mental states of man are only from the result of chemical interactions of the nervous system. The Discovery of the Unconscious Mind and Symbolic Knowledge the second result pertains to the epistemology, specifically to our present topic. In relation to the conscious mind, the unconscious mind, which is now regarded scientifically as an indisputable fact, is as the unseen ghaib to the evidence or shahada. The unconscious mind is the unseen of man's being. We were also saying ghaib and shahada, but in the sense that shahada refers to the body while ghaib means the mind. Today it is proved that not only do we have a shahada, the body, and ghaib, the mind, but we also have a more hidden ghaib, which refers to the unconscious mind. 
The body can perceive itself through the five senses. We can discern the conscious mind through the inner sense, but how can we do the same with the unconscious mind? Did Freud and the like discover the unconscious mind in the laboratory? If they had seen it in the laboratory, then it would be the body and not the mind. One cannot see the mind in the laboratory, and no one has ever claimed to have done so. And if they themselves said that they had felt it in their selves, then it was actually a set of signs and symbols in the conscious mind that they saw and gradually discovered. Through these signs, manifestations and expressions, especially those that happen in man in the world of imagination, they came to realize the existence of the unconscious mind. For Freud, the world of dreams served as the key to solving the problem of the unconscious mind. That is, through the existence of dreams, he found out that man has the unconscious mind which cannot be seen in the microscope or intuitively witnessed by acquiring psychological awareness, for instance. Signs, in general, showed that we have such an unseen or hidden thing. What kind of knowledge is this? This is the same symbolic knowledge I discussed during the last session. God the Exalted has given the human mind certain characteristics to utilize as a signs or symbols of whatever it perceives or senses, so as to unravel its interior or inner nature. Man discovered the unconscious mind, did not feel it but discovered it, and he discovered an unseen from that evidence. Was the planet Neptune discovered for the first time through a telescope? No. When a certain mathematician and astronomer studied the solar system as a whole, he said that there must have been also an orbit in such and such part of the outer space, and a planet must be orbiting along it, and that it was impossible for the solar system to consist only of then known planets. That is, he discovered the existence of Neptune on paper. Later, when more powerful telescopes were invented, others confirmed what he had earlier hypothesized by intellection and reflection on signs and symbols. A comparison between the knowledge of Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham peace be with him, and that of psychoanalysts. What is the difference between the Prophet Abraham on one hand and Freud and all psychoanalysts of the world on the other? What is the difference between Prophet Abraham and the discoverer of Neptune? Their difference is that their work is related to a part of the world. Freud discovered a part of man's being while the discoverer of Neptune discovered a part of the solar system. Meanwhile, what did Prophet Abraham do? Prophet Abraham made the deal all at once. He did not limit his view to the human mind. He did not limit his view to the sun, the moon, and the earth. He took the corporeal world, the world of nature and motion in its entirety into consideration, saying that this world has certain unseen or hidden things. At the outset, he made a study of himself. He perceived himself as an adaptable, changeable, and subservient being, as well as an existent possessing power or capability, which gives him motion and movement when he was small, it made him grow, and it is presently making him old. He perceived motion and change throughout his life. The idea came into his mind that there must be a source of change, movement, and development in the universe. Prophet Abraham, peace be with him, was then living in isolation inside a cave. For many years, he had been in a place where he could rarely see the sky. When he looked at a rising star for the first time, he said, Is this my Lord? Is this the same being who nurtures, develops, and gives me motion, and the force which is in control of my life? In Surah An'am, verse 76, it states, But when it set, he said, I do not like those who set. When it set and changed location, he said, This is also like me, changeable and unfixed. It is subservient and overpowered. It is evident that it is not in control of itself. He looked at the moon and saw it brighter than the stars. He said, This is indeed my Lord. After some time, as the moon moved away from its earlier location, he said, Like me, this is also a particular. It is seemingly performing a duty. It is also under the control of a different power. 
When the sun rose later, he said, This is indeed my Lord. But he saw afterward that the brightest and most luminous star was also subservient. He exclaimed at once, So all of those that are of this type are like me. We are all evidences. This universe as a whole is manifest, that is, zahir. It is like the upper part of the watermelon. Its greater part is that which is hidden. In Surah An'am, verse 79, it states, Indeed I, that is Abraham, have turned my face toward him who originated the heavens and the earth as an upright one, and I am not one of the polytheists. That is to say, I let my face understand the fact that the celestial and terrestrial kingdoms are regulated by the unseen being beyond them. In terms of the nature of epistemology, there is no difference between the knowledge of Freud and that of Prophet Abraham, peace be with him. The epistemology of Abraham, peace be with him, had no difference with the said astronomers and yours, in the example cited in the last session in relation to Ayatollah Buru Jardi or Sa'adi, as far as the nature of epistemology is concerned. The nature of epistemology in both cases is one and the same, but addresses different subjects. You are familiar with the works of Sa'adi and Ayatollah Buru Jardi. You can discover many things, from the solar system to the existence of that planet, and from man's conscious mind to his unconscious mind. But the prophets, they were sent to deepen human knowledge. The difference between science and religion lies here. Science is meant to expand and increase man's knowledge, while religion is also meant to expand his knowledge, but to expand his depth of knowledge. Religion is meant to declare that the entire universe you can see, in comparison to the unseen world which encompasses the universe, is like a ring in the desert. A ring in comparison to a vast desert is so insignificant. This is also the case of the universe vis-a-vis -vis the unseen world. Religion does not negate anything in this world. Rather, it also presented and shown the majesty of the other world. Our discussion on the stages of knowledge ends here. And with that being said, may God's salutations be upon Muhammad and his pure progeny. End of chapter 7